Hey, hey, real estate rock stars. This is Aaron Amuchastegui. Hey, you're about to hear the interview I did with Qasem Aslam. The uh, what a fun name, right? The he has run. Uh, he's built a, a lot of different businesses, and you know the bulk of this interview really goes into hiring talent, but hiring remote talent in other countries at like a fraction of the cost. But an interesting perspective he has, it's not just hiring an assistant to fill out DocuSigns for you or an assistant to help you with paperwork and stuff you don't want to do. He's talking about outsourcing you know, ways of, hey, I've got this new business idea and here's somebody that can start and run the whole company. Or, hey, I've got this. And it, there's some really, really high level stuff. He's got some great reasons for it. And he has some really interesting perspectives of if you're planning to hire uh, in other countries, what the difference between India or the Philippines or South Asia or uh, or South America, you know, why one's country might be better for different types of talent. So I hope you guys like this one. Without further ado, here we go. All right, Kasim, I'm excited about our chat today, the, especially the few minutes that we've got to, to chat so far. And the, there's a lot of things that you've been involved in, in, in real estate, in business, of uh, building big businesses, exiting big, big businesses. I think we're going to talk a lot about that. Um, now, let's start with the, let's, let's first start with something kind of relatable for our real estate people out there, because the biggest thing that we're going to teach them is actually how to run and scale a business and how they can do that for the lowest cost possible right through different talent around the world. And I can't wait to get into that. But the, but before you got into this, the, from our talks, you talked about, you know, wholesaling, developing things like that. How did your entrepreneur journey start? I'm the world's greatest failure, Aaron. I've failed at literally everything twice. And uh, I think that tends to be true for most entrepreneurs. So I'm a dropout. I had no job prospects whatsoever. Um, it, fun fact, you and I both got hit by the same meteor. I was building banking software um, when on Bank Failure Friday when the FDIC came in and started kicking down doors. Yeah. I was in the bank that brought down Lehman Brothers. As a matter of fact, check this out. Hold on. You ever seen the movie The Big Short? Oh, yeah. So for those of you listening, I'm holding the book, The Big Short, and my book happens to be signed by the COO of the bank. And uh, what people don't know is the, bank sh the Big Short was actually, they never say the name of the bank, but there's pictures of the bank and the bank owners in the movie in one of the montages. It was Ray Lamb's bank, First National Bank. It was one of the largest bank failures in US history. I think the largest private bank failure ever, if memory serves. And that was the lead domino that just dropped, that killed everything. And so I was building software for that bank. That was the, the beginning of the end for my first entrepreneurial journey. And I was an absolute douchebag, man. I was making more money than a kid should make. Mm -hmm. And I bought the house on the hill and I had the idiot's car and I was always picking up the check and I had $200 shirts and $100 haircuts. And then overnight, my whole world just collapsed. I lost everything. Houses foreclosed on, cars repossessed. I'm trolling Costco for tree, free tryouts. Like that's, you know, like when you go to Costco Friday, Saturday, Sunday, all the free food. Dude, that was my lunch. And uh, I had to rebuild from there. And it was so empowering in retrospect. It was the most, it was the best thing that's ever happened to me, you know, cause I'm 22 years old and I, and my whole financial world was annihilated, but I learned so much about what really makes businesses move, how important liquidity is, what money is really, what you own and what you don't own, et cetera. So that was my genesis. So that was like 07, 08? Yeah. The bank failed in 07. So I was, I, I got hit before everybody else got hit. Like, and that's the other thing too that right, sucks. The, the first bank failures that came before the foreclosures, people kept saying it's not going to go nationwide. It's not going to, Nobody had really started foreclosing yet. It didn't, the wave hadn't hit yet. Yeah. So I lost my house before everybody else lost their house, which kind of hurt because when you're in, when you're in the storm and everybody's getting hit, you have an excuse. I just oh, yeah. thought I was a dummy. Yeah. Yeah. Once there were so many foreclosures and short sales back then that, yeah, eventually it just became acceptable. It wasn't a big deal. Instead of having to wait seven years to buy a new house, it became three and then two and then things. So like, oh, seven, oh, eight, where were you living at the time? Scottsdale, Arizona. Cool. Yeah. So you're in Scottsdale. I remember being out in Scottsdale in 06, 07. And then when First National Bank got uh, taken out, like they had a billion dollar like development portfolio of loans that got sold through the FDIC. And we were out in Scottsdale looking at some of their assets. Like our first thing was we like we were out of business as a home builder and we were trying to figure out what we we're going to do 
next. And there was like these old bank tapes would come out from these like construction loans from some of those first banks that got taken over by the Fed. And so the, yeah, we were, we were, we were running uh, similar paths in, in different circles. So, all right. So you were in banking entrepreneur, you learned a whole lot of stuff, the, and re, and you saw what failed and what didn't. And you had very quickly hit uh, one of your many rock bottoms, I'm guessing. Uh, <laughs> well, if, you're not, if you're a true entrepreneur, there isn't just, you hit rock bottom and then you do it. I tell people I went broke three or four times and knock on wood, it doesn't have to happen again, but the, um, but sometimes, you know, agents probably understand this. We have good years. We have bad years. Entrepreneurs understand this. So what'd you do next? I started to troll Craigslist for web work, which, you know, if, if you've built software in the past, doing web work is like the cook washing the dishes. It just Did you go felt, to school for software? No, no. I was actually, I didn't even really know how to do software, man. I, I, I was more a liar than anything else. I was just good at hacking things together. And so if somebody's like, hey, could you do this? My answer was always like, yes. And then really, I would just figure it out in the back end. And it, it was at an interesting time too. Um, I'm, I'm old enough to where I saw the transition from a software perspective go from proprietary to open source. And if you're listening and you know what that means, it was, it was actually kind of a cataclysmic shift. It was like this great big black box moving into, hey, we're going we're gonna to start coding on stuff that everybody can speak. And so I was just outsourcing uh, I'd go get a gig and then I'd find somebody in India, Pakistan, Asia that could, that could do the work. And then I would quote unquote project manage, um, sometimes not very well. And when the global economy collapsed, that went away. And so I started kind of doing things myself and that led me to, you know, my subsequent entrepreneurial endeavors, which, which actually led me to fix and flips and wholesales. I started running ads. I ran ads for a buddy. He was doing fix and flips in Phoenix, Greg Bilbro. He's still in the game. Shout out to Greg. And um, he was doing like bandit signs and door knockers and direct mail. And I, I told him, I was like, dude, at the time, I actually don't believe this anymore, Aaron, and I can share why, but I was like, Google ads is going to crush all that. Like I bet money I'll be able to beat everything you're doing with bandit signs. And we spent $1,000 a month for, I think, nine months, zero goose eggs. And right when we were about to pull the plug, we got our very first wholesale deal. And we made like a couple bucks more than we'd spent up to that point. But it kind of helped us hone the model. And so we started genning up leads with Google ads and we got more leads than we could work. And so at first we tried to be partners and, you know, play all those games and bring on sales reps. And we finally just decided to start selling the leads, which led to one of my first successful businesses and my first exit. Actually, I sold the business to Greg later, but we built a company called GeoFlip and we started genning up leads nationwide for real estate investors. And I learned a ton of stuff, dude. I learned that if somebody types in sell my home fast, that's a far less valuable lead than somebody who types and sell my house fast. And anecdotally, mm. we think it's because if you use the word home, you have a psychological attachment to the property. But little things like that really changed the game for us from a real estate perspective. And we were genning up leads for a fraction. You know, home investors was paying $500 per lead in Phoenix. I was paying 70. So we were, we were minting money there for a while. I sold in 2019 because the market turned. And I don't think you can use Google. I don't think you can use any inbound lead generation if it's not a buyer's market and a seller's market, because you need two things, you need motivation and you need equity. And if it's a, if it's a seller's market, there's no motivation. Why would I sell to you at a discount when I can just go place this retail and, you know? Yeah. Or, or you can do a for sale by owner on Zillow and it actually sells like exactly. 2020 in 2020 people could sell their house by putting a sign out front. They didn't need listing agents to do it. So the, that's pretty interesting. And the, and it is a, it's in, and what I liked about what you said is like the sell my home fast versus sell my house fast. There's so much of advertising that there's these different stages of analytics that takes, um, it doesn't take, it's not that difficult to analyze as long as you have data points, right? But it's also not, it's, uh, it's also not like uh, easy or uh, maybe it's easy, but not, like, it's not simple in the sense that like you have to go back and look at all those leads. And so if I'm trying to like repeat what you said for listeners, you might pay $3 a lead for sell my home fast. And you might pay $5 a lead for sell my house fast. And, or you might pay like, you know, a dollar a lead for sell my home in Arizona. You know, there's all these different things. And so a lot of the ways that when people first start running ads as agents, as investors, as anything, is they're going to go, oh, I'm, I, here's a terminology that I think people are going to use. And here's, and, and this is the lowest price. So I want this many people to like see it or click on it. And there's ways you can go through Google ads and say like, what are people actually searching? Oh, most people are actually are searching, sell my house fast or sell my home. So there's these, these steps to get the ad going, but that's only step one. When you first post your ad 
and you have a $500 a month budget or a $1,000 a month budget or a $5,000 a month, month budget, that's a very small part of the equation because now you're bringing in leads. But you still don't know if you're bringing in good leads or bad leads. You don't know if you're bringing in leads of people that are going to click on your website or people are going to click on your website and fill out a form. So the back end analysis of just what you said, where you know that like you got leads from sell my home fast, you got leads from sell my house fast, but a higher percentage of the sell my house fast people bought, then you realize you could pay way more for those leads compared to others. So for any of you guys out there that have done leads online and you're maybe a little discouraged or you've invested some money and you're like, hey, this seemed to work, but I didn't actually get a sale, um, try doing some of that back end analysis because none of it is meant to happen overnight. And one of the guys whose interview is popping in about a week or two, he just started a new business, a new lead generating business in real estate like 18 months ago. And he had a very slow couple of years, but now he's going to do 750,000 revenue this year because he has, because after six or seven months of trying, he found the vein. That's and I remember when I for us too. That's yeah. exactly right. Yeah. And it kind of happened in reverse order too. When I first ran ads, they were really successful. When I first ran Facebook ads for sale, I got all these leads right away. Like one in five was actually a deal maker. We were making money and then all of a sudden something small changed and our ad that was amazing stopped working, you know, and I know that, that you've always got to be willing to pivot. So, so first you just did that mostly in technology. Your buddy had a need. He's probably telling you over coffee and you're like, oh, I can fix that. And then again, you outsourced it. You said, hey, I think I can do this. You learned enough about it to be dangerous. And then for, for a lot of the work, you started to outsource it. Uh, to other places. Um, and now I think that's probably maybe one of the biggest parts of, of our, of our focus. So the, uh, it's a couple of things that happen when uh, real estate grows or goes up, right? I remember as any business starts to grow, as commissions start to grow, agents say, or investors say, Hey, I really need to hire somebody because I'm so busy right now. And I'm doing all this really annoying stuff. I hate turning utilities on or off for things. I hate doing these. I hate doing DocuSign paperwork. And then they go to hire somebody and they hire an agent to work in their office full time. And they realize they really only had 10 hours of work for that guy. And so then as the market starts to fall, instead of getting help at all, they have to lay the person off or make changes. And so the, so there's two things that can happen if the market's getting slow, right? Like you can, you can one, you can cut your expenses and just accept you're going to do less volume. Or you could maybe reorganize your expenses in a way where you're just spending your time on your high dollar stuff. And I think just by the way that we almost start our conversation before we hit record, I think you've probably got a way for people to look at, you know, when to hire and when to do it themselves, right? And the type of people to hire. So let me just give you a chance to kind of open up with that and, and, and say like, all right, so somebody is growing a business in real estate, in wholesaling, or really anything right? They're growing a business and they're trying to figure out, Hey, there's too much work for me or Hey, there's a potential here to do a lot more houses, but I can't cause I'm only one person. There's a potential to grow, but I'm only doing this. So how do they figure out who to hire and, um, what tasks can they hire out? What tasks should they do themselves? In the very beginning, I think everybody, everybody in the entrepreneurial world, especially real estate professionals should be delegating their email and their calendar management. It's the easiest thing to delegate. It's the lowest lift in terms of training. It's also the most impactful by far. There's a fun mantra in every real estate market I've ever been in. It's always speed to lead. And we saw that when we ran GeoFlip, we had an agreement with our customers. Aaron, I would fire a customer if they couldn't get to their leads within five minutes. You were fired because we always sold, we sold our markets to one investor. So in Atlanta, I had one guy in Atlanta, Anthony Epps, good dude. Um, in Portland, I had one person in Portland. In Phoenix, I had one person in, in Phoenix because we were generating all these leads, but it didn't make sense for me to have multiple investors. You had to agree to two things. One, you're going to buy everything I could produce. Two, if you couldn't get to your leads within five minutes, you were fired. Because I knew that if you weren't answering your leads within five minutes, you were going to come to me later squawking about the leads not being good. And with inbound leads, especially we, we, if you didn't get to them within five minutes, there was a precipitous drop in terms of their ability to qualify later. So for real estate and professionals, speed is so critically important. And that's not just true with leads. It's true with customers, strategic partners, all the relationships you're building. And if you're tied to your phone, that means you're not doing higher dollar work. 
So having an assistant that can sit there and monitor not just your email, but also your social, your inbox, your Slack, whatever messaging channels you're using, uh, and put you in a position so that other people feel like, oh my gosh, I cannot believe Aaron is that productive, fast, responsive. That's the type of thing that, that I think massively elevates you above your competition. Because the truth is, the expertise of a real estate professional is very difficult to ascertain in the beginning. So even with an educated consumer base, it's really hard to know, and forgive me because I'm about to slander our collective environment, it's hard to know who's like the part-time soccer mom or dad who's just trying to make an extra butt and buck and pretends to be a real estate person, and who's like the hardcore assassin, bloodthirsty killer that really knows everything about the market and, and can truly provide value add. And so real estate, I think, real estate professionals get a really bad rap because there's a lot of folks in the space that just don't know what they're doing. Well, how do you set yourself apart? And it's hard to do in the beginning because it's hard to determine subject matter expertise when we haven't started talking about real estate yet. So I think the way to do that is infrastructure. And that infrastructure can be, you know, it's 17 bucks an hour. It's a $17 an hour problem, which is what I think a good assistant should cost you, will cost you. And if that person is monitoring your communication channels and managing your calendar, it puts you in a position to be seen in a way that people are like, oh, wow, you really know what you're doing. And the more you work with a good assistant, the better that assistant will get at answering questions like they're you. I don't believe in having people respond as though they're you, but I think people responding on your behalf, knowing how to manage communication, knowing when somebody asks a question, who to, who to tap so that just doesn't never even lands on your desk, that's the type of thing that a good assistant can do. And that's one of the most leverageable skills you can hand somebody. Because if you have somebody, a really good right-hand man or woman who knows how to assist you in a way that you don't have to necessarily manage tasks, you're managing projects. Now, in terms of your, what would you say, time to profit ratio, that's, I think, the thing, the, the, the easiest thing a person can do to amplify their income right out of the gate. Yeah. Okay. So the, so first getting the, you know, the assistant helps you manage, can reply back and forth to emails and the, and my assistant does that. You know, my assistant reads more of my emails than I do. And then she's able to reply to people in a timely manner. And sometimes she says uh, she's me. And sometimes she says that she's her as she's doing it, but depends on who it is and the conversations and things like that. But it works really, really well. Now, um, the, for your current, for, for like your current businesses, right? Before we, before we hit record, we said there's lots of different outsourcing, right? I said, I've got people that work for me that live in the Philippines. I've got people that work for me that live in India. I've got people that work for me that live in South America. And, um, you know, and, and you talked about kind of the history of uh, virtual assistants. And most of the time I would actually go into this, but there's probably a lot of people listening that have hired virtual assistants in the past 10 years and had a variety of experiences. And that will, that, that could impact how they feel about future and choices and things like that. And, um, I might be incorrect in this. My belief, I guess the way it worked for me was, you know, 15 to 20 years ago when I first got VAs, it was through India and then 10 to 15 years ago. And I still have those guys. I got a full software team in India, a full office. They work full time for me and they have for 15 years. Um, and then uh, five, maybe four to five years after that, I started in uh, the Philippines and I have people in the Philippines that do some very specific roles for me. Uh, they do accounting, they do graphic design, they do property management type work. And then, um, then I've got uh, a gal in Mexico that does actually like architecture and like full architecture drawings that we do for permits and you know, that we build off of and things like that, uh, you know, working out in Mexico. But I think my, uh, the reason I went into that long drawn out part was it feels to me, it feels like every 20 years ago, everybody's going to India 15 years ago, everybody's going to the Philippines. And now there's these different options. I also do think that like maybe 08, 09, I probably had someone in the Ukraine do some quick software work for me. When I first got on Upwork, there were people in all sorts of European countries, um, as well. So the, so what do you know of the history of, uh, of virtual assistants and like the difference from one country to another? Yeah, I've, I've been hiring internationally for 20 years. Uh, I think it's the thing I'm best at in the world. I can tell you, and this is going to get real dangerous here, and so I'm going to choose my words wisely. There are common denominators in terms of the type of talent available in different geographic regions, and there are also common denominators in terms of the issues that you will face. I'll give you some examples. 
uh, I'm going to pick on my own heritage because that feels safer. My father's Pakistani, my mom's white, uh, but I know Pakistanis really well. And I can tell you, Pakistanis cannot be on time for anything. So if a Pakistani tells you Friday at noon, it means Monday at four. And that's generally true in South Asia. They don't have the same adherence to time as we do. And a lot of that, from an anthropological perspective, is, is due to, to the, the life that they're forced to lead because of infrastructure issues. The train is never on time. Traffic is always bad. Power is always going out. And so you have a whole group of people that are forced to just be a little more, um, what would you say, open to the idea that the deadline isn't necessarily the deadline. So if you're going to hire out of India and Pakistan, you just have to be cognizant of that fact. Some are better than others, and I realize that I'm stereotyping folks, but there's a lot of truth behind it. Um, I've also found that there are there are pockets like India and Pakistan are great for engineering jobs. So if you need software developers, website developers, uh, love South Asia. Um, I've found the Philippines is great for creatives. So if you need graphic design, content creation, great in the Philippines. Uh, Eastern Europeans are awesome to work with, but and one of my best friends is from Ukraine. He started as my EA, uh, became my CTO, moved to the States, is now one of my best friends and a business partner. I'd be saying this if you were on the call. They won't do things the wrong way. So if you ask an Eastern European, hey, I know the square should be a circle according to best practices, but the client wants it to be a square, so we're going to make a square. They will not do that. And so you just have to know how to participate inside of these, you know, there's uh, cultural barriers, language barriers, idiosyncrasies, et cetera. The thing that I've found, my favorite place to outsource right now is Latin America for a bunch of reasons. I like Argentina. I like Colombia. The Argentinian economy is in free fall. They're, the peso, the Argentinian peso is, is degrading minute by minute. They have to go to Google every day and check inflation rates to see if they can buy groceries. It's tragedy. Hopefully it stabilizes. They just had a regime change. I like this new guy that they have. But... In terms of arbitrage, you get way more bang for your buck paying in USD when you go to Argentina. And you can truly change somebody's life. The average Argentinian white collar employee is making about $250 USD a month. So you could pay many, many, many multiples of that, provide them with meaningful work. They get to work remotely on a semi-flexible schedule. And you have the most dedicated employee you've ever had in your entire life. They have stable power, stable internet, phenomenal English proficiency, one of the highest college graduation college graduate rates in the world. Uh, the country of Argentina produces more economists than any other country in the world, ironically. So it's a great place to outsource to. And again, I'm going to say things that are mildly offensive. But if I take somebody with an Asian accent, like my father's accent, and I put them on the phone with my Trumper client, my Trumper client's going to get pissy. Because Asian accent generally means call center, you know, whatever neuroassociative conditioning issues they've run into. If I take somebody with a Latin accent, and I put them on the phone with my Trumper client, it could be their neighbor. The American ear is more accessible to the Latin accent and far less, what would you say, frustrated with and understands more. You also don't have the same uh, issues with holidays like Indians, Pakistanis, Filipinos, different religions, different cultures, way different holidays, diametrically opposed to ours. The Latins are almost exactly what ours are. No issues with time zones. So the, all the cultural barriers that you've dealt with in outsourcing I don't want to say they go away, but they flatten massively with Latin America. So if you've had issues in the past, the last thing I'll say, and then I, I'm sorry I'm talking too much, Aaron. Asian cultures, generally speaking, again, this is a massive stereotype, but I'm just going to say it and everybody who wants to yell at me can come yell at me. They penalize people for innovation. So like if you're in a company in India and Pakistan and you do something new or different, you don't get any incentive to that. If you make a great big mistake, you get nailed to the wall. There's no incentive for coming up with new, better, different. It's, hey, maintain status quo or we punish you. Latin American countries are far more industrious in terms of the way they look at tasks, like North Americans. So a Latin American is more likely to say, hey, I know we're doing it this way, but we should be doing it that way. Then you'll ever see come out of India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Philippines, etc., because of those cultural idiosyncrasies. Now, can you train the Asian temperament out of that? Sure. Absolutely. I've done it. I've seen a bunch of really industrious people have done a lot of really good things. But generally speaking, is the stereotype that just ends up being the status quo. And so not having to fight the status quo by going to Latin America has been really, really beneficial for us. Man, I want to I tap into a couple of things there because that is um, something I hadn't thought of. Uh, but uh, specifically, when we're hiring VAs. So we use virtual assistants from other countries to manage our properties. We use virtual assistants from other countries to cold call real estate owners to see if they want to sell their house. You know, the, um, we use it for, you know, incoming 
customer service in our software company. So we use a lot of, of labor. And so much of our interview process is based on, um, on the accent and how well uh, they can sound American. Um, so I think that I think that's a normal challenge. I know that I know you're also worried about outcome of. I think there's a normal challenge of one of the reasons people say, "Well, I don't want to hire someone in another country," because anytime we're calling, you know, AT and T to get our internet back on, and you can tell that it's someone from another country, the there is this frustration that I think a lot of uh, a lot of us as just Americans have to go like, "Oh, no one's dealing with our issue," you know, you're not dealing with it. And that's been around forever. And I, and I think, I don't think it's correct anymore, but I think it's just like a fundamental thing. And so, yeah, so I could see how, whereas uh, even, uh, even my guys from the Philippines and India that speak really, really good English, you can usually tell um, that, that it's English as a second language and that's where they're from. Uh, but I, but the point, and, and I think your point you're saying is from South America, it's the same right? They're going to speak, they're going to speak and have an accent from where they're from. But actually in the U S there, because it, it's, it's so common, people aren't going to know if they live here or not. I don't think people care about the ethnicity, but people do care if they're talking to someone in our country or someone else's. Yeah. I don't do that. I wouldn't cry, cry racism at all. I think 99.999% of the time, it's not that. Yeah. Jordan Peterson has this great quote. He goes, we assume racism and really it's just in-group preference and novelty response. People aren't being unkind, they're not being cruel, they're not being malicious, but they want to be understood and they want to understand. And it's so frustrating when I have a problem and I'm on the phone with somebody that either I don't understand or doesn't understand me. And so yeah. Latin Americans watch our TV, listen to our music, watch our movies. You know, one of our biggest exports uh, as Americans is culture. And some of the consumers, the largest consumers of that culture tend to be Latin American. So in terms of alignment, cultural alignment, ability to connect, ability to converse, I think that's so, so, so important. And you see that in Latin America a lot. And it obviously, it's heavily dependent upon um, where they are in Latin America and also their socioeconomic placement, right? So, yeah. but white collar educated Latin Americans tend to be, I think, some of the best labor pool presently available in the international market. So let's talk about what can be outsourced, right? Because normally what people think is um, uh, the easier tasks uh, the better. Right. But I think one of your points that we had on before, so like one of my CPAs is, you know, uh, is from the Philippines. And so I pay a much lower rate, but they've been, but they've taken the same classes and the same courses that like the, you know, that my CPA, uh, born and raised here is. So like, what are your, some of your ideas of levels of stuff, um, that can be outsourced or could it, and, and, and using the word outsource to say, Essentially, remote workers somewhere else in the country at a lower rate. Yeah, right? like since the, international. Now there's remote workers everywhere anymore, and and when and when you outsourced, you could have been outsourcing to another, you know, American engineer somewhere else or anything else. Like outsourcing just means hiring somebody else. So the so I want to talk about especially VAs in uh, particular. What are the things they can do? What are the things they can't do? Yeah. So I think when people have a bad experience outsourcing, very often they're the problem. And that's not meant to just lob a grenade in everybody's lap because I've done this too. But, you know, I'd ask somebody if they're like, oh, yeah, I outsourced our data entry, our cold call or whatever boiler room work they're outsourcing. My question to you is, is how long could you do that job well? You know, that's soul sucking no matter where you are. And I think we have this flawed view where, gosh, as long as we're paying more than they'd make domestically, they should be happy to do this job. But that's not true because yeah. you still have people in China lobbing themselves off of the roof of Apple factoring, you know, manufacturing plants because a human can't sit there and do soul sucking work eight hours a day without slipping at some point. So what I tell everybody is go start delegating things that you don't think people are capable of and you will be shocked. I call it the black box delegation. So very often when we're delegating, we're like, I need you to do this and then this and then this and then this. And then we sit there and we watch it. Well, that's not productive for anybody. It's not productive for me, the person watching. It's not productive for whoever it is I'm delegating that task to. Instead, black box delegation says, uh, just hired somebody, Frank. Hey, Frank. I need this accomplished. So I'll give you a specific example. When I made my exit, I got a big bag of money, but I didn't know what to do with my big bag of money. So I went and joined Justin Donald's Lifestyle Investor Mastermind. And I, I found Justin out that everybody- really well. Yeah, he's a good dude. Yeah, he's a good I buddy. I found out everybody wanted self-storage facilities. So I sent a two minute, 30 second voice message to my, at the time EA. I want to start buying self-storage facilities. I need you to build me the website, the CRM, the pipeline, and the marketing materials for us to do exactly what we did over at Geoflip. 
It took me about two and a half minutes to explain the nuances. In a weekend, he built me the website, the Go High Level CRM, all of the ads. We started running ads, you know, sell myself storage facility fast. I bought a facility recently in North Carolina for $490,000 that would retail for seven hundred fifty. dollars So that two and a half minutes of my time made me $250,000. I split it with a business partner, but it's a quarter of a million dollar delegation opportunity. I didn't say this type of website, this logo, this brand, this whatever. I delegated the entire project. I want to buy self-storage facilities. Here's how I'd like to do it. Here are the resources that are available to you. So the black box says, here's all the resources available to you. I'm willing to spend this much, use this tap down on these other employees, et cetera. This is my end result. Everything that happens in the middle, go. And when you start delegating that way, you actually elicit things like proactivity, creativity, responsiveness, instead of sitting there saying you have to do exactly this and exactly this way, exactly these, you know, whatever. So, so put yourself in a position to capitalize on what a human is truly capable of. And this is going to get real weird, Aaron. And hopefully not too soapboxy, but dude, people are miracles. The human being is an absolute, complete and total miracle. You'd have to be, I don't care if you're an atheist, you'd have to believe that is a literal truth. The fact that there are these ultra smart, self-propagating apes that just walk around building shit is unbelievable. And for us to think that only people in the Western world, English speaking, college educated, that applies to like, that's hubris, right? There are, there are miracle humans everywhere in the world. And interestingly, there's actually more available to you internationally because you're not competing against Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Apple, Facebook, who's snapping up all the best talent in the US. So you can go to these international markets and you can find these miracle humans who in any other environment, if they were born in the States, would be C-level execs of Fortune 100 companies. But they're not, they don't have that opportunity. You get to be that opportunity. And if you hire them and you treat them like they're dipshit automatons that have to follow a script, you're going to get a dipshit automaton that follows a script. But if you start treating these people like they might actually be industrious and creative, you get the most industrious and creative employee you've ever had. And they're so committed and loyal to you. If you pay them well and treat them well, sadly, you're the only one. You, you've hired out of India and Philippines. How many times have you heard people say like, oh, my past employer didn't pay me or my past employer treated me poorly or my past employer maybe worked 60 hours a week. Like if you treat people well, if you let them work, flexible schedule, pay more than they could expect to get paid domestically. It's the Pareto distribution. It's why our recruiting agency is called Pareto Talent because there's the 20% of people that do 80% of the work and you can find those people as a rule. And when you find those people, all you have to do at that point is take the leash off, stop micromanaging them. And they are off like a freaking shot, man. It's unbelievable to see what this talent is capable of, especially given what they cost you. You know, my employees, when I hire internationally, cost me less then my benefits package would cost me if I hired domestically and they do more and they're more grateful and the impact I make on their life is substantially more. So again, I hope that wasn't too soapboxy, man, but it's, it's no. just unreal what's possible. Well, that's, it's a different perspective. I think a lot of people hear when they think about, there's two things you said there that I think are really important for me and my team to hear. One, it's like the, they're humans too. And the, so if all they're doing is cold calling sellers, every day. Right. And we tell them, yes, like every, you know, we're going to get plenty of FUs, but the, but you know, after you dial 200, you're going to get three or four people to tell you to F off, but one person is going to tell you yes. And if you get three or four yeses a day, you did a good job. So they're dialing all day long. And yes. And the mindset has been, but we pay them double what they would get paid out there and this is their job. And Hey, they got eight hours to do it. Like we just ask that they do it and they've done it before. And you're saying like, hey, just remember, like the could any human sustain that for a long period of time rather than look and say, hey, they're not doing their job they were assigned for. Is it a reasonable expectation? So I think that was one thing you said that's going to stand out to me um, in ours. And so that that was one of the first things, you know, reasonable expectation. What can they really do? Can humans really do uh, the, you know, that the low levels? Because essentially we go, hey, I don't want to call these people anymore. I need to hire somebody to do it. I don't want to do DocuSigns anymore. I need to hire somebody to do it. Now, in theory, there's probably a personality out there that loves talking on the phone, that loves dialing, that loves getting yelled at. That's probably like a who, not how uh, scenario or maybe a different way uh, to see that is there probably is a person person that's perfect for that. So you're saying rather than take somebody skilled and throw them into a job that sucks that they could be good at, but eventually it's unsustainable. What if there's something else? And then you're probably the first person that has said, like, no, bring on one of these people almost like a C-suite or like, an, like, a, like a high level assistant or like a project manager, bring them on as a project manager and going, hey, here is something I want to create. I've got this new business idea to do this, this, and this. I want to create it and then let them run 
and do it because you're saying they're the super smart guys and they're out there. So let's talk uh, international wages. The yeah, there's a couple things that have happened. Like when I hire somebody direct on Upwork, I get one fee. When I go through a management company, um, I pay another. I pay a different fee. There's usually different things included in that. I've had some where there's like a, there's a company called the Outsourced Accountants in, in uh, the Philippines. They have a big office that everybody goes to. So everybody's required to actually go to the office, clock in, be part of this like office culture. But then they're working on the phone, you know, on the, and the computer for me. So what are you paying people in South America as a percentage wise to the role here? Whether they're an accountant, an architect, uh, a cold caller. And then is that about the same in India or the Philippines? No, I think the Philippines tends to be maybe the most cost effective from a labor pool perspective, or at least it used to be. You, you and I, I mentioned this to you beforehand. The Philippines is a small country and a lot of people have gone there. Wells Fargo's there, GoDaddy's there, um, Target's there. And so the Philippines two, three, four years ago really felt like blue ocean. Now, if you've been outsourcing to the Philippines, you may have experienced what I've experienced, which is there's less and less and less people and the people that are available are of lower quality than we used to see. That said, the, the financial arbitrage in the Philippines is still really high. So you can get away with paying two, three, four bucks an hour sometimes. I don't recommend it. There's nothing more expensive than a cheap employee. We'll say that again. Yeah. There's nothing more expensive than cheap employee. So what I like to do is I like to go 10% more than the high water mark at a minimum. So if the high water mark, like the high water mark for an entry level assistant in Latin America is probably fifteen hundred bucks, so why not go spend seventeen hundred bucks, eighteen hundred bucks, two thousand dollars? This is if you're hiring directly and get yourself an absolute killer. The way to do this, by the way, is to set up. I call them fly traps. So when we run our cohorts, we end up this the most recent cohort that we ran for executive assistants. We had thirty eight hundred applicants, thirty eight hundred applicants. Only three hundred of them were accepted. Of the 300 that were accepted, I expect to graduate about 30 EAs. So it's a one percenter. And the way to find that one percent, first of all, is don't do interviews. It'll be soul sucking and destroy your life. Build in fly traps that let you know who pays attention, who follows instructions, who's being industrious and creative. And I do a bunch of things. For instance, my job description always reads, uh, in order to apply, your subject line should read, I actually read the instructions. And then if their subject line reads, I actually read the instructions, they need to have actually read the instructions. And I'll ask them to do little things. When you send me your resume, send it in a PDF format with this naming convention. I don't care about PDF. I don't care about naming convention. I care that you can stop, pause, read the instruction, and follow it even if it's simple. So anybody who doesn't follow the simple instructions immediately gets weeded out. Of the people that follow the simple instructions, and I'll give you away some trade secrets here, and I think these are pretty cool. When somebody applies and they followed all the instructions and I like their formatting and I like the way they approach me, I'll say, hey, Aaron, uh, I've done, you know, I've, I've spent 20 years hiring hundreds and hundreds of people. I can tell you, interviews tell me nothing unless we've worked together. Let's you and I do a trial project. I'll pay $20 for two hours worth of work. In any international market, that's pretty good. It's not great. It's not going to make anybody rich, but 20 bucks for two hours is fair. And it does a couple of things. It sets the bar high because I'm paying you for the work now. So you actually have to do it. It also tells you that I respect your time. When you say yes, I ask you for your PayPal address and you're the international employee. When they send me their PayPal address, I pay them the 20 bucks and then I don't follow up. So if you're going to do this, you know, with 10 to 20 people, 200 to $400, and it tells me who's not being integrous, who's willing to ghost me for $20, because that's a really good thing to know, uh, yeah. who's not paying attention. And what's kind of cool is sometimes a month or two later, I'll have somebody come back to me and say, hey, you paid me $20 and you never sent me the trial project. In my mind, I'm like, well, I'm glad I didn't hire you. Because if you can't follow up during the application process, you're definitely the type of person that needs to be managed during the employment process. And I don't hire people that need to be managed, period. So yeah. I want people to follow up and say, hey, you paid me the money. Where's the project? And then I make it worse. I send them the trial project. The project should always relate to the job that needs to be done. And when I send the project, I send them something they need to log into. So you have to log into this drive folder. You have to log into this Canva. You have to log into this whatever. But I send them the wrong password. So I'll say, hey, here's the scope of work. How long do you think this is going to take you? I never tell them how long it should take. I make them manage me. So, oh, it's Monday. I think I can get done by Friday because I need to know that they can assess the situation, be accountable because it's two jobs I'm hiring them for, right? It's the job that I need them to do. And it's also remote work, which is the job unto itself. When they tell me how long it's going to take, I send them the wrong username and password and I wait to see how long until I get a frantic message from them going, the password doesn't work. So little, and you don't have to use my flight traps, but make it hard. Those are make brilliant. it hard. Because then at the end of it, by the time I get the trial project from these people, all of them are qualified. As a matter of fact, all of them are ultra qualified. And when I, when I was building a business that scaled, I had almost 100 employees at Solutions 8 before I sold it. Sometimes I'd hire three or four people. I'd be like, all these people are amazing. We're growing at a breakneck pace anyway. Bring them all on. But you get to really choose the cream of the crop. By the time you get to the interview, 
everybody's good. And now it's like, who's a good personality fit for me? And I tell people, I pay you better than anybody's ever going to pay you, but I'm actually paying you what the job is worth because I have unreasonably high expectations. And I hire slowly and I fire quickly. The first time you make a mistake, it's my fault. Hey, Aaron, you know, this happened. I obviously wasn't very clear in my expectations. I'm really sorry, but this is unacceptable. And this can't happen again. Are we on the same page? Yes, follow up with something in writing so we're on the same page. The second time you make a mistake, it's your fault. The third time you make a mistake, it's fired. And I let people know during the interview process, this is how we're going to manage folks. If you do that, if you set up a filter that allows you to really hire one percenters, and then you treat them like grownups, I don't screenshot desktops, I don't make people track hours unless it's pertinent to the job, right? So if I'm billing by the hour, they track hours. But I treat them like real life human beings. We have weekly calls where we all get together and just bullshit and talk. We do, you know, like fun Slack channels where we can talk about the books they're reading and the music they're listening to. Like be a good place to work, be a good human being, treat them more than they'd ever, be better than they'd been treated by other international employers. And you find yourself in this position of being, sadly, a unicorn. And dude, the people that I've been able to produce, it's been unbelievable what they're capable of. And nine out of 10 people aren't entrepreneurs. This is, you mentioned Upwork. This is why Upwork's bad. Upwork is a whole directory of entrepreneurs. So A, you're, charging, you're being charged way more because there's people that have cracked the international code already themselves. Upwork, Freelancer, all those, those directories are just entrepreneurs. You want employees. Because most people aren't equipped to be an entrepreneur. Most people are employees. But that's good. It's good for you. It's good for me. And to be honest with you, it's good for them. It's the roles that we've assumed. And so if you can find good, hardworking employees and you can incentivize them appropriately, it sucks to be a business owner, to be a real estate professional, and feel like you're the only one dragging the sled up the hill. And when you get these employees, the ones that I'm talking about, the true Pareto principle employees, they help pull. As opposed to usually when you hire an employee, you feel like you're just throwing them on your back and you're dragging them along too. So that's that's the paradigm shift is make it hard, only hire the one percenters, incentivize them to be one percenters. And then most importantly, treat them like one percenters. What people do wrong when they're managing employees is you give somebody 10 things to do, right? And they suck at two and they're okay at six and they're amazing at two. For some weird reason, all conventional wisdom has taught us, go focus on the two things they suck at. And so now it's like, all right, fellow, we'll get you there and we're going to put a performance improvement plan in place and I'm going to coach you on a weekly basis. And, and it's like, what are we doing? Just take those two things off of their slate and go focus on the two that they're the best at in the world, right? Like, why are we so obsessive about, well, this is the job description. This is what you have to do. No, that's why I love hiring assistants first. My assistant never stays my assistant for long. My first assistant became my director of social. My second assistant became my director of automation. My third assistant became my CTO and is now one of my best friends and my business partner. So the assistant is the best role to figure out what somebody's good at. If you give somebody 10 things to do and they suck at two of them, stop giving them those two things. Go find yeah. the two things that they're amazing at and then build a role around them for there. And what's really cool is it can be self-perpetuating because then they can actually build that department. They become the department head. They hire other people underneath them. They know how to manage them, how to train them, how to scale them. That's how I built. Dude, I mean, if you look at me and most of you are probably listening, but if we were on video right now, you think to yourself, this is not a man with a plan. Like I, I, I had a hundred employees, 200 clients and a hundred million dollars in ad spend under management. I built the largest Google ads agency in the world. I've never run a Google ads campaign myself and, and ever. And I did it because I was able to find these people, these unbelievable miracle humans, and they're everywhere. The same person who would just be a cog in a machine at another agency became a miracle at mine because I just had a frame change. It was just a paradigm shift. So they're, 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 these folks are exist. They exist. And as your business scales, they'll help you pull. They'll help you scale up. I made an eight-figure exit. I, knew, I made an eight-figure exit in an industry with the averages that aims at 15% margins, I had 40% margins because I was hiring international, I was hiring these amazing people. Dude, the, this has been a, a fascinating interview. It gives me lots to think about the, for both help, help and growing businesses and just the statement that you said of at the beginning you would take on jobs you didn't know how to do and then you would hire somebody that didn't know how to do it and then running a large, well, no, but the, but like running a, but running a Google ads agency and never running an ad yourself like it is a point of there are probably lots of entrepreneurs out there with dreams and ideas of something that they are passionate about that they can grow and do. And part of what's stopping them is they are like, I don't know how to do that. And a frame shift of, well, somebody does know how to do that and you could probably do it. It's great. We're out of time, but, but for, if people want to learn more about you, if they want to reach out to, to you or they want to like help themselves learn more about, about hiring uh, virtual assistants throughout the world, what sort of resources can they look at or how can they reach out to you direct? 
Yeah, my, I have a recruiting agency. We, we train and staff EAs out of Latin America. We don't staff for any grunt work. So, you know, if somebody's like, oh, I do need somebody to, to pound the pavement or make 100 phone calls, not that there's anything wrong with that, but I just don't staff for that. But if you're looking for an assistant that really can be like a partner or a chief of staff or grow with you, go to ParetoTalent.com. I give away my hiring framework. I'm actually writing a book called Hire Right Now. So if you want to go to Kasim.me, that's K-A-S-I-M dot M-E, that book will be free to everybody. Uh, my goal in life is to help people in emerging nations achieve more poss- more opportunities. And so if you don't hire through my recruiting agency, that's fine. But I'd love it if people started looking at international hires as more viable and if they started giving them jobs that weren't just grunt work because I think they deserve it. And it, it's just, it's a true win-win. So Pareto Talent, if you're interested in hiring one of our EAs, it's three grand a month. Uh, Costum.me if you just want to learn. And I'll give, I'll give you the framework for how I find these people. Yeah. I freaking love it, man. Well, this was a lot of fun. Well, listeners, you have heard it. So when I first said, I said, how do I say your name? He said, it's Costum, like awesome. And, uh, and this has been really, really fun and fun that we, uh, that our lives have been, uh, you know, balanced out. We've had a lot of the similar ups and downs in those same time frame. So I hope you, I hope you guys reach out to him uh, and you can learn more about what's going on. And just like we said today, you know, shared a lot of tips on how to go hire. So he told us the framework if we want to go hire people ourselves. If we decide we don't want to hire them ourselves, then we can have a guy like him help us go and do it. The As always, if you enjoyed today's podcast or if you didn't, please go click give me a review. I would love to hear how I'm doing and how I can make this show better for you. We still have uh, uh, spots available for our mastermind in March out here in Austin. So these, so if you're interested in coming out to that, it's realestaterockstarsmastermind.com. Our event is the absolute next level. It's like the first masterminds that I went to and I paid five and $10,000 to attend. But what I've accepted and understood is real estate agents, especially right now, don't have money like that. So I put on a $10,000 event at below cost so I can get a bunch of cool agents together. It's about a thousand bucks. Go to realestaterockstarsmastermind.com. Three days of some of the best interaction you're ever going to have. And uh, as always, real estate rock stars, thanks for listening. Kasim, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me.